I'm ministering this morning on how to stagger not in barren times. How to stagger not in barren times. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, this powerful, powerful word of God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving God of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to receive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. I want you to go with me now over to Romans. Romans the fifth chapter. And we're picking up the same thought there in the fifth chapter of Romans. And every verse that I'm reading is an important verse for our hearing. Romans, the fifth chapter, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein you stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Justified by faith, having peace with God through Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith. Can you say by faith? Into His grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope, of the glory of God. Now, I usually don't read this much scripture, but I want to go back up to the fourth chapter of Romans. And let me share with you these verses because it all goes together. Romans, the fourth chapter, beginning reading at the 16th verse. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Notice especially verses 19 and 20. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also. Say it with me. But for us also. This story is not just about Abraham. It's about believers of all times. But for us also. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The reason I read so much scripture is because every scripture that I shared 
is absolutely necessary as we look at the story that is before us of how to stagger not in barren times. Now, what is a barren time? It's the time between our believing and the time of our receiving. A barren time is between believing and receiving our healing, our finances, our breakthrough, our breakout, even greater revival. The day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls came to Jesus, and many times we act as if the second chapter of the book of Acts was the high water mark or the high benchmark or the high mountain of all Pentecostal experiences, but it was not many verses after the second chapter of Acts until 5,000 people came to Jesus. No, I'm not seeing all I want to see, but I'm thankful for what I am seeing. No, I'm not experiencing all that I desire to see in the things of God, but I'm thankful for what God is doing. No, I'm not seeing everything in Calvary Cathedral that I would like to see and that I desire to see and that I will see, but I'm rejoicing in what I do see, seeing all, seeing all that I see is something that comes through the eye of faith. I'm not seeing everything I'd like to see in me, but it's coming. I still look into the mirror and I say, oh boy, you need some working on. Please be patient with me. God's not finished with me yet. I look in our church and I see so much to be thankful for, but there's so much more, so much more, so much more in our nation. This week I had a little few moments of frustration with all the things that have been going on and then it came back to me with such power and I realized how can we change a nation, a nation that is so messed up, a nation that doesn't even know English, a nation that doesn't understand questions. I mean it just, you know I'm going to tell you something friend, I've said it for years, if you tell the truth the first time you don't have to remember what you said. But if you don't tell the truth the first time, you better have a battery of lawyers helping you to remember what you said with the right spin. I looked at that and I said, God, what is the hope of America? God said what it's always been, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The hope of America is in Jesus, revival, righteousness, repentance, the fear of God. You know, God has changed this nation before if you'll go through church history, and I believe God's going to change it again. God spoke to my heart even Thursday night, and he said, the hope of this nation is in the youth of this nation. You say, but but I'm turned on. Well, then you're part of the youth. You have a youthful heart. If you're religious and no one can tell you anything, and you've seen everything, and you know everything about everything, but doing nothing about it, What you say, you know, no, no. God's going to pour out of his spirit upon those that have a youthful spirit and on youth who dare to believe God for his greatness and for his power. Revival has always come through youth. Study church history. You see, they're not tainted with all the politics. They're not tainted with all the confusion. It's amazing how... You know, I know sometimes there's a parent and child thing of, yeah, yeah, but I'm going to tell you what, you get a youth that really has a clear head and let them talk to you and they'll talk some horse sense to you about what's right and what's wrong and what should be and what ought to be. They have a tremendous sense of what's right on the inside. As we look at this, how to stagger not in barren times, the time between the time that we believe God and the time that we receive from God, I've studied the Word of God this week. It's just gone off in me like a rocket. I'm not going to stagger in the process of God's promises coming to pass. Abraham staggered not. Even though Sarah was barren and her womb was barren and Abraham was 100 years old, Abraham staggered not. I just thought through the word of God, Noah faced 120 years of barren times. You know, we think we have it so hard sometimes. The one man I want to meet when I get to heaven is Noah. He was in a 120-year building program. 
Noah built the ark for 120 years and preached at the same time. He was building and preaching righteousness. Building and preaching righteousness. Think about it. Building and preaching righteousness. It wasn't all preaching and it wasn't all building, but he was building the ark under the instructions of God and then he was preaching righteousness. And hey, friend, it didn't come to pass for 120 years. You think you got problems? Abraham faced 25 years of barren times. Just as Noah faced 120 years every day, the laughing stock of the whole part of that country. Hey, let's go by and see the fool Noah. Let's go by and laugh at Noah's ark. He talks about something called a flood that's coming. Let's go laugh at Noah's ark. One day the world's going to have their last laugh. One day the last stand-up comic is going to mimic his last church and his last preacher. He's going to mimic Jesus Christ for the last time. And God will say, I've had enough. Noah was the biggest fool that ever lived until it started to rain. It's kind of like Andrew Womack said last Sunday morning. He said all the atheists and all the agnostics and all those that did not believe in God when the bombs started to fall and the bullets started to be fired, every one of them began to cry out to God for mercy. As they say there's no atheist in the foxholes. Abraham faced 25 years of barren times. David faced many years of barren times between the time that he was anointed to be king and the time that he became officially the king. I thought of Habakkuk who faced barren times, three chapters that just cry out, how long, O Lord, how long? But oh, thank God, the last chapter is an affirmation of God's faithfulness. Joseph faced barren times, bleak times, barren times, had a promise of God in his spirit, but he just kept going back to the pit and just kept going back to the dungeon. But oh, thank God, between the pit and the dungeon, one day there was a palace. Joseph had some barren times, and I thought about the great apostle Paul. He had some barren times, telling us of all the things that he faced, shipwreck and beatings and nakedness and peril and all of those things in the Corinthian letter. If you ever have a bad day, just read what Paul went through so many, many times. John the Baptist had a barren time. He was the one that pointed that prophetic finger and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now he's in prison. Now he's in prison. Now he's in prison. And you know, I don't care who you are, there's days that you need some help. There's days that all of us need some encouragement. There's days that all of us need a helping hand. There's days that all of us need some encouragement. Could you believe that this great prophet of God sent the message and said, is this the Christ or should we wait for another? Jesus sent the message back. You tell him blind eyes are being opened, the sick are being healed, miracles are happening. No, he doesn't have to wait for another. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos faced some barren times, bleak times, the most dismal place that you could put anyone was the Isle of Patmos. I love this man. You know, there's some people it takes every ounce of praise and every ounce of worship. It takes the piano, the organ, the instruments. It takes every ounce of supernatural energy to get a little praise the Lord. I was in the cleaners last week or week before that and there was a precious little lady picking up her choir robe and and uh, the lady that attends the church, she said, well, honey, you ought to come to our church. She said, we're happy. We're a happy group of people. And she said, you know, I, I went to visit the church of the lady that I've worked for for a period of time and said through the service, the minister was preaching a pretty good message. And she said, I lifted my hand and said, whoa, praise the Lord. And said she leaned over and said, we don't do that here. <laughs> and she said, well, honey, you come to our church. We do that here. <laughs> John on the Isle of Patmos, no Hammond organ, no piano, no drums, no guitar, no, no brass instruments, no praise singers, 
just sitting there on a rock. And he said, I believe I'll be in the spirit on the Lord's day. (laughs) Oh, I love that man. And we had a house full of John on the Isle of Patmos kind of folks this morning. Dear Lord, it raised the roof. Had a barren time, but he turned his barren time into a Jesus time. Now, a barren time. The time between when we hear the word of God and we receive it and we believe it until the time that it literally comes to pass. Oh, glory to God, I've got a promise. Everything's going to be all right. And then days of nothing, nothing but bills and unbelief knocking on our door. But I thought we sang that chorus, everything's going to be all right. Well, just hold steady, it will be. I think we can learn something from the father of faith, Abraham, on how to stagger not in barren times. Follow me closely, and I believe I have some meat here that will help you. First of all, how to stagger not in barren times is to remember that this is a 100% faith deal. When all emotion is gone, your faith in God will see you through. And faith in God will always find a way to do the will of God. It will do it. You see, as you look into the Word of God, everything God offers us is by faith. Well, Brother Nichols, I don't have faith. Yes, you do. If you're a born-again believer, God has dealt to every believer the measure of faith. Well, I don't have much faith. You have enough to move mountains. And let me tell you the truth, you're using your faith every day on things that you don't want to happen. You say you're using your faith every day to call things into being that you don't want to be saying things that you don't want to happen. And then when they do happen, you say, well, why doesn't God love me? What? Where'd my luck go? We call in bad luck, and then when it happens, we blame God for it. We call in disaster, and when it comes in, we blame God for it. Our brother Arneson down there, man, they, they had the word out that floods were coming to Sioux Falls. Floods were coming. They said, get ready, get ready, get ready. Now, you don't talk like this unless you have faith in God. He said, the flood will not touch us. The flood will not touch us. And the flood did not touch them. All around them, the flood did not touch this precious brother and and their work. God protected them in those massive floods that were there in the Dakotas just recently. You see, the average person, oh, my Lord, I guess we're going to lose everything. Then we do, we blame God. Why did God let me down? I'll tell you our attitude ought to be, if anybody gets blessed in this city today, it's going to be me. If any family gets blessed in this city today, it's going to be my family. If any church gets blessed today, it's going to be me. Lord, if you're looking for someone to bless, bless me today, Lord. Well, you're already blessed, but you know what I'm talking about. Remember that this is a 100% faith deal. Therefore, it is a faith, according to Romans 4, 16 that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Therefore, it is a faith. Say it with me. Therefore, it is a faith. Everything that God offers us is by faith. And remember that this is a 100% faith deal. That's why we try to teach you as much as we do, not only in our services but our Bible school, that the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk says it four strong times in the word of God. It said the just shall live by his faith. Secondly, oh, this is so good. Praise God. Don't chop your rope of hope. How not to stagger in barren times. Romans 4, 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. You've heard me share the story a few years ago as I flew into Vancouver to preach for a convention there. A man picked me up at the airport, and I always like to find out what's going on. I said, what do you do, sir? Are you a minister? He said, well, I teach and so on. But he said, really? He said, I'm not a full-time minister. I've taken this week off from my job just to transport the ministers from the airport into the convention. And I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a tree feller. Well, now, I didn't know if he lived in a tree planted trees, 
you know, a tree feller. I'd never heard that expression before. And I said, sir, could you explain to me what a tree feller is? Well, he said, I bring down big trees, those huge trees up in the Vancouver, B.C. area and out in the forest area. And I said, okay. I said, are you good at it? He said, I'm very good at it. And I said, could you give me some instruction? What would be the first instruction you would give me if I was a tree feller? What would you, give me a little tip here. He said, don't chop your rope. Now they use steel in their rope or use steel type of safety bands. But at that time, they had a rope, just a, you know, just a, a good strong rope. He said, I've lost two friends recently who got so busy chopping the tree down, they chopped their rope, their safety rope. Boy, God spoke to me and said, tell people, don't chop your rope of hope. Some of you are so busy living for God, be careful. You're going to chop your rope. You see, that safety rope is what holds them on the tree if something goes wrong. But if you chop the safety that holds you, oh, folks, we need to get a tight grip on hope. Hope, that happy anticipation that a better day is coming, joyous anticipation that God has better things for us. How to stagger not in barren times. Remember, this is a faith deal. And number two, don't chop your rope of hope. That's good ministry. Let me bring this other insight out. Don't consider negative circumstances. But they're there. I know it. But they're all around me. I know it. But don't consider. Don't focus. Don't put your attention on negative circumstances. And the scripture for that again comes from our great heart of faith. He considered not, in Romans 4, 19, he considered not his own body, now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Folks, we're talking about a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman having a baby. Yeah, right. Sure. That'll make the medical journals. <laughs> Considered not. But I believed God and things are getting worse. Considered not. But I believe God and the symptoms are getting worse. He Considered not. But I'm praying for my children and they're getting worse by the day. Considered not. Don't consider circumstances. I could tie that into the message of last Sunday morning. Don't glorify or magnify circumstances over the Word of God. The Word of God is the surest thing in your life. Don't consider, don't meditate on, don't focus on negative circumstances. Thank God for Abraham. I know he had his ends. Listen to me. This will help you. Because you cannot honestly read the life of Abraham without realizing that he needed some help. There were times when Abraham was a piece of work. I would not have wanted to counsel his wife. No way. When the tale of woe unfolds, my husband said I was his sister. And in essence, gave me to another man. In defense of Abraham, she was his sister, but she was his half-sister. He told half the truth, but a half lie will get you in trouble. You said it, but how did you say it? You know what God's dealing with us? Yeah, the White House lies, but do you lie? Yeah. Well, mine's a white lie. Mine's a gray lie. No such thing. God is saying, body of Christ, listen up. Look up. What you deplore in high places, check your own self out. Tell the truth. Be honest. Be honorable. So other people cheat, do you cheat? Not only is the spirit of revival real, but the spirit of repentance is real, my friend. This too is revival. Getting your life right with God, this too is revival. Paying debts that you 
tried to beat. That's a testimony that cannot be denied. Someone said something to me the other day. I asked them if they were in service. Just one of those quick things you pass by. At last Sunday morning, I was just making reference to the message. They said, yes, I was. Well, in a little while, there's a call that came and said, Pastor, I've got to tell you the truth. No, I was not in service. Have you ever said something you didn't intend to say or you said it and you wished you hadn't? You know, I don't know. We're human. There's only one perfect man that nailed him to a cross at 33. The rest of us need some help. So Abraham went through some ups and downs, some ins and outs, and yes, there was some things in Abraham's life that needed working on, and I've ministered along those lines before. But listen to Pastor Bob Nichols very carefully. There came a moment, just as surely as there came a moment in my own life. I remember as a young person, in and out, up and down, off and on, it seemed like I couldn't get a grip. It seemed like I was a classic Roman 7. But there came a day when Romans 8 clicked in place in my spirit and so helped me God from that very moment until now. I cannot say that I've never failed God, but I've never gone back and I've never looked back because I realized that I didn't have to go back. I realized that I was an overcomer through the Lord Jesus Christ. That nay in all of these things, I'm more than a conqueror. Somehow I didn't get the picture. I tried in myself. I tried, but then... I learned how to trust. And when I learned how to trust, I said, oh, that's the way it works. I try and I try and I get deeper and deeper and say I'll do right and then go back two steps. But oh, thank God when I trust and obey, when I trust and obey, when I trust and obey, I find out there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Don't consider negative circumstances. Dwell on it. Think on it, meditate on it. Oh, here's another one. Stagger not at God's promise through unbelief. Stagger not at God's promise or promises through unbelief. Now, I want you to write down what I'm saying at this point because it's very important. Back in the Old Testament, when you speak of staggering, it really gives a connotation of being drunk or drunken, someone who's drunk or drunken and that type of thing. Coming over to the New Testament, you're going to be as surprised as I was as many times as I've studied this portion of God's Word. That word, stagger not, what does it mean? Remember, we're ministering on how to stagger not in barren times. All right, I've believed God, I've given, I've planted seed, I've planted my faith, I've done the right thing, but it's not happening for me. It's happening for everybody else, it seems, but it's not happening for me. Someone else got a new car and my old car just had a wreck last week. You see what I mean? Someone found $100 on the pavement and something happened that cost me $200. And you start comparing things. But listen, how to stagger not in barren times before it comes to pass. I don't think some of you understand how many barren times we've gone through since 1964, times when it looked like it was never going to come to pass, times when it looked like it would never come together, burst of success, burst of blessings, burst of growth, and then it seemed like you take 10 steps backwards. And then we moved downtown. And someone said, Pastor, when you get downtown in that lovely building, all the people are going to be coming. Oh, they stayed away in multitudes. Because a building is not what it's all about. It's all about God. How do you stagger not in barren times? And then about that time, a church opens up out in a distant state and the salary is about three or four times what we were meagerly able to get here at that time. The devil said, I think you may be getting a call. And after I prayed about it, I realized I was getting a call, but I was getting the wrong call. I'm glad I stayed. Easiest thing in the world to do is quit and run. Stagger not at God's promise through unbelief. What does it mean to stagger not? That word stagger means to think contrary to. You can't be a negative person and have positive results. You can't have an unbelieving mind and have faith exploits. It means to argue. I meet people this day, they want to argue with me about the word. I'm not going to argue with you about the word. I didn't write it. Argue with God. I've met people, 
They'll argue about anything. Just like a habitual gamble. They'll bet it will, they'll bet it won't. You know, they'll bet anything just to get a bet going. To stagger not means to think contrary to. I'm telling you folks, one day it's going to hit us like a thunderbolt. We can't walk around thinking negative, believing negative, expecting negative, wallowing in negative things without negative things happening. It's cause and effect. Well, let's move on here to think contrary to, to argue or to be argumentative, to condemn, to question constantly, to by unbelief drink yourself into a <laughs> into doubt. Some people drink, but they always wind up that sound like country western song, doesn't it? She's drinking because. I'm drinking because she left me or she left me because I'm drinking. It goes either way. That girl who waits on tables used to wait on me at home. <laughs> to by unbelief drink yourself into doubt and doubting God's promises. And you're not going to believe this one. It means to sue as in a court of law. Anybody sued God lately? I'd like to talk to you because I know you didn't win. Pick a fight with anybody, but don't pick a fight with God. And remember every one of those characters in Hebrews 11, it looked so impossible until the manifestation came. The darkest hour really is before dawn. So when he staggered not at God's promises, there came a time in Abraham when it didn't make any difference what Sarah said, what circumstances said, what his body said, what anything said, he refused to think contrary to God's promises. He refused to be argumentative with God. He refused to question constantly, why God, why God, where are you God? He refused to let unbelief intoxicate him into a state of doubting God's promises. He refused to file a lawsuit against God. I'll never forget a man who said, well, I'll sue God. He's dead today. That's one deal you don't want to get involved with. Amen. Staggered not. When the pressure was on, when he was getting older, when it looked more impossible by the day, he refused to think contrary to. He refused to be argumentative. He refused to question constantly. He refused to let unbelief intoxicate him into a state of doubt and unbelief. He refused to try to sue God as in a court of law. Staggered not. Abraham, explain this. I can't. What do you know, Abraham? I believe God. What about your body? I believe God. What about your circumstances? I believe God. It's getting worse, Abraham. Face reality. I believe God. 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 Well, there's two more insights here in the fourth chapter of Romans on how to stagger not in barren times. And the next one is stay strong in faith by giving glory to God. Magnify the Lord. Glorify the Lord. You know, we discovered in teaching in class earlier this morning, there's three good reasons to praise and give thanksgiving to God because it keeps you free, it keeps the devil bound, and it makes God happy. Anything that makes me free, anything that keeps the devil bound, and anything that makes God happy, I want to be a part of it. That's why this is such a happy group of praise singers because as they praise and give thanksgiving unto God, it keeps them free, keeps the devil bound, and it makes God happy. <laughs> Whenever in doubt, just praise the Lord. Whenever in doubt, just magnify the name of the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You know, sometimes David didn't know what to do, so he'd just get his little harp out, and he began to sing a song in the natural, and before long, he's singing a song in the spirit, and we get the benefit of it. You can start 
in the flesh and end in the spirit. You can start in the pit and end in the palace. You can start beneath the heap and wind up on top of the mountain. You can start with nothing and wind up with everything. When your faith is in God. Oh, here's another one. Stay fully persuaded. Abraham was persuaded. Fully persuaded. Fully persuaded, according to verse 21 of chapter 4, that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. You say, but pastor, it's going to take a miracle. I know. We serve a miracle-working God. But pastor, it's hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Walk in as I do every day and speak the word of God over our daughter and she's getting better. We're not there yet, but she's getting better. I think my wife has a much stronger faith than I do. I'm a, I'm a daddy. I get all, you know, I, I don't know. There's just something about daddies. I guess we need to be tougher and stronger or something. But I have to, walking away from that bed, I say in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, not moved by what I see. I'm 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 not moved by what I hear. We still have that sign on both doors to her bedroom. Only the language of faith spoken here. Only the language of faith spoken here. Stay strong in faith. You see, Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. And one more I must give you, and you need to get the hold of this one, from the Galatian letter. Let me give you the point, and then I'll quote the verse. Remember, we win if we faint not. Remember, we win if we faint not. There's one rule to the faith game. You faint, go back, nothing. We win if we faint not. We win if we faint not. Winner takes all. But they only won that football game by one point. They won. But they only won that hockey game by one score. They won. I'm not concerned about how big I win. I'm just rejoicing that we play the game until we win. We don't quit on the first day and we don't quit on the worst day. We play until we win. We play until manifestation comes. We play until the word comes to pass. We win if we don't quit. Be not weary in well-doing. There's days we all get tired. Sure we do. Be not weary in well-doing. For in due season ye shall reap if ye faint not. Remember the biggest fool that ever lived was Noah until it started to rain. Probably the next biggest fool in that day and time was Abraham. <laughs> Hundred-year-old man, wife's 90 Talking about having a baby. Well, wait till 2020 gets a hold of this one. Wait till Dan Rather gets a hold of this one. One picture's worth a thousand words. And all the yeah, yeah, and all the whatever, one day was shattered by wham. Abraham and Sarah had a baby. Because praise and thanksgiving keeps you free, keeps the devil bound, and makes God happy. Because praise and thanksgiving keeps you free, keeps the devil bound, and makes God happy. Andre Crouch had a song years ago, we're going to keep on singing. We're just going to keep on singing. We're going to keep on preaching. We're going to keep on testifying. We're going to keep on sharing the love of God. We're going to keep on praising God. We're going to keep on giving thanksgiving unto God. Praise and thanksgiving keeps us free, keeps the devil bound, and makes God so happy.